the campfire, the source of many wondrous childhood memories for me and many others. Sadly, as we shall learn in tonight's three deliciously creepy tales, the same cannot be said for everyone. Now, my dear friends, you know what to do. Sit back and relax with your favorite drink, because it's time to listen. Summer camp was a memorable part of my childhood, but most memorable was that summer of 72. It was my last summer as a kid. I'd just turned 15 and was looking forward to starting high school in the fall with the older teenagers. Camp Tonkawa was located in the thick forest of East Texas, about 43 miles from my home. There was nothing really exceptional about the camp. It had the standard amenities, a lake, lots of woods to explore, an archery and rifle range, and a nature preserve. The thing that was exceptional were the three leading counselors. Mr. Rivera was a would-be jock and was in charge of organizing sports and running the archery and rifle ranges. Mr. Holloway led arts and crafts and taught camping and outdoorsmanship. But the counselor I remember most was Mr. Blackburn. He was a kind of a brainiac and maintained the nature preserve. He also taught us about the flora and fauna around the camp, but was particularly interested in bugs. He'd been a doctoral candidate for several years before and studied insects in the Amazon basin. No one knew why he didn't finish his doctorate. He was certainly bright enough. It wasn't hard to imagine Mr. Blackburn in a cocky outfit and chasing insects with a butterfly net through the rainforest. <laughs> he was a bespectacled man of about 35, with tussled dark hair and the hint of a beard which grew steadily longer as the week progressed. He was uh, far from fastidious in dress. In fact, in other circumstances, you might call him a slob. His denim jeans had seen better days, and were often uh, besmeared with mud, <laughs> while his shirts bore the scars of battles with briars and brambles in the wild. It was the end of August, and the end of camp. Tradition dictated that we rendezvoused at various campfires in the evening of the last day. Each campfire was supervised by one of the counselors, and it so happened that Mr. Blackburn attended our I was in a group of about ten or eleven boys, sequestered in a small clearing on the lake shore. We roasted marshmallows and made hot dogs and s'mores as the twilight passed into night. In the bright fire's glow, we passed the evening with talk of the past and dreams of the future. The campfire crackled and cast a protective circle of light. Above us, an endless number of stars stretched across the heavens and around us, an endless void of dreary night. We huddled close to the light, for although none would admit it, the surrounding darkness held terrors we could only imagine. In a pretend show of bravery, someone suggested telling ghost stories as the night grew darker. I'll tell you boys, the Amazon is a femme fatale, at once beautiful and dangerous, oh, and the heat, oh, the heat is stifling, is a place of contrast. There are ageless trees that rise on every side and dominate the land. There are magnificent waterfalls and birds and animals found nowhere else in the world. The jungle is often breathtaking, like some magnificent painting elegantly and lovingly created with exquisite strokes on the world canvas. But within the beauty, there is also danger. 
There were things in the jungle no tale of horror could hope to describe. There are man-eating cats that prowl the night, and piranha that devour a man during the day. There are spiders as big as your head, and monstrous snakes that are the stuff of nightmares. But the thing even the natives dread. The creature that kills without pity or remorse is the black caiman. What's that? One of the boys hesitantly interrupted. A creature from the blackest abyss of hell, son, Mr. Blackburn continued. It's the devil's blend of alligator and crocodile that prowls the river and kills the unsuspecting. Its black head is invisible on the water, but its dark, lifeless eyes watch you, waiting, floating nearer and nearer. Then, with a lightning flash of jaws, its teeth rip you open and you hear your own terrible screams as the creature swallows you whole. The sudden cry of an owl caused an involuntary scream from us all. Our eyes strained against the darkness and imagined the creature lurking silently in the lake just beyond. Mr. Blackburn paused a moment to let us reflect on his description. We all became a little more aware of the night. We stopped at one of the local villages to trade for food and water and heard the stories of a monstrous black caiman the natives call Rio Morte. <laughs> it means river death. Few have seen the creature and lived. You know, boys, he added, the river people say the jungle keeps its own. They believe that when the jungle takes a life, it leaves Hanatu. That means the ghost who walks. They're the spirits that have neither grave for rest nor fulfillment of earthly purpose. And so, they wander the earth for all time. They are drawn to the living, for they feel the energy of life that has been denied them. They long for the warmth of another human being but feel only the cold of premature destruction. The river people respect Hanatu. They fear only Rio Morte. Loaded with supplies and information, we set out again on our journey down the Amazon. Carlito and I fruitlessly searched the river banks for the elusive butterflies, then continued downriver. It was late afternoon and the sun had already disappeared behind the forest canopy. Dark shadows fell across the river as daylight surrendered to the encroaching night. As we slowly paddled our inflatable launch, we had the vague, uneasy feeling of being watched. The dark Amazon waters meandered through the jungle and we became acutely aware of the sounds of the approaching night. Suddenly, behind us, there was a splash. We both looked, but only saw turbulent water near the riverbank. Then Carlito saw the thing in the dim afternoon twilight. That huge dark head and black eyes protruding from the river Rio Morte, Carlo cried. Rio Morte. I drew my pistol and fired at the beast, but the bullet glanced off his thick hide and the creature disappeared beneath the water. We searched the Inky River in vain and suddenly a vicious blow struck our boat from beneath and Carlito was thrown overboard. He frantically struggled to climb into the boat and I grabbed his arm and began to pull. With a sudden thrash of water, Carlito was pulled from my grasp. The beast rolled over and over in the water. I heard Carlito scream in terror and agony, 
as the river turned crimson and the creature disappeared once more. I paddled feverishly toward the riverbank, but I could see that black head follow faster and faster. With a great splash of water, those huge jaws suddenly ripped into the boat. I was thrown into that murky water and began to swim harder than I ever did before. My heart pounded, and I panicked as I clawed at the precipitous riverbank. That black monster from hell swam closer and closer. I suddenly felt a crushing pain on my ankle. I was struggling, helpless, as I was pulled under the river and breathed its water into my lungs. The storyteller paused, then said, Maybe this story is too scary. Let's finish the story later. Then, there was a cry of protest from one of the boys. No, tell us now. What happened next? Well, our narrator continued. Then, he ate me, of course. Mr. Blackburn smiled and faded away into the dying campfire glow. There I was, at the front entrance of Camp Slenderwood, the beginning of my seven-day-long prison sentence had begun. I never was into the outdoors. I much preferred staying inside, browsing the internet. The only reason I was there in the first place was because my parents wanted some privacy to uh, do their taxes. I was almost 18 and I knew what that really meant. I figured it would be better just to go with their plan than to uh, interrupt their alone time. Still, I had to admit to myself that the camp didn't look particularly unpleasant. The weather was nice, the trees were fresh and filled with green, and there was a crystal clear lake nearby the cabins. I figured it would at least be tolerable to stay here, even without a Wi-Fi connection. I decided I would give it a fair chance and keep an open mind about the new experience. In the middle of the camp, between the lunch benches, was a stage with a mustached man wearing a Camp Slenderwood t-shirt. Dozens of campers had already begun to surround the stage while the man yelled through the microphone. Welcome, Welcome to Camp, Camp Slenderwood, kids, he shouted. My name is Elwood Dulcie, but you can all call me Elwood. I'm the owner of this place, and I live here all season to help run the camp and answer any questions. We had an amazing turnout this week. There are six to four teens here ready to learn what it means to survive. I wondered to myself what he meant by uh, survive. There was nothing in the brochure about this being a survivalist camp. We were supposed to be provided sleeping quarters and three meals throughout the day. Was I going to be expected to hunt a boar or something? I figured he must have been exaggerating and let the thought go after a few moments. We've already assigned everyone their cabins, Elwood continued. Just grab your camp ID cards from Lexi over there, and she'll point you in the right direction. He pointed to a pretty blonde in her twenties, who was also wearing a Camp Slenderwood t-shirt. She looked cheerful, almost overly cheerful, and was waving ID cards in her hands enthusiastically. Kids began rushing over to Lexi to grab their ID cards and get their assigned cabins. I followed as well tuning out the rest of Elwood's speech. With any luck, I'd find someone to spend these seven days with that felt 
just as out of place as I did. Fortunately, not long after that I bumped into a quiet looking guy trying unsuccessfully to load up my favorite forum on his phone. His name was Brian, and we hit it off instantly, spending most of the first day talking about how dorky all of the camp supervisors looked. They were all over the top friendly, <laughs> and seemed to care just a little too much about what kind of day everyone was having. Two counselors had already asked me if something was wrong when I'd not finished all of my Salisbury steak. One of them even offered me cold medicine when I cleared my throat. The only worker who seemed normal was Mr. Todd, the cafeteria supervisor and cook. He wasn't quite as talkative, but at least he didn't constantly patronize us. Brian and I wound up getting separated after dinner. I got to know a few more of the campers at that point as well as see the camp supervisors put on a show and dance with no background music. When I got to my cabin that night, I was disappointed to see Brian was not in the same one. There were three campers inside who apparently were my roommates. They seemed like alright guys, but none of us talked much before going to sleep. I was actually excited about what was in store for the next day. Morning came very quickly, and it wasn't long before I found Brian sitting near the cafeteria. The benches were less full than yesterday, but it was still early. At first I thought most of the campers were still in bed, but by late afternoon it still felt like half of them were missing. I went up to Mr. Todd and asked him if all of the kids had come for breakfast and lunch. Mr. Todd shook his head and plopped a burger on my plate. I couldn't shake the feeling that something odd was going on. Everything felt much more active yesterday. There were only a few people circling the camp's Slendwood puppet show, and even fewer were spread out in the woods area. I became more suspicious when I realized that a good amount of campers were still missing by dinner time. Huh. What was going on here? I wish I'd gotten to know everyone better the first day, so I could figure out who was still here and who wasn't. When I got back to my cabin, all three of my roommates were already inside. It comforted me a little to see them. Perhaps I just made a mistake. I decided to check with them to see if they'd noticed anything strange. To my surprise, they all shrugged my question off and acted like they didn't know what I was talking about. Was I just making myself go crazy? How could over 30 kids just up and vanish without trace or without anyone saying something? The thought was ridiculous and I laughed about it to myself as I fell into a deep sleep. third day, things got even weirder. I guess my nerves were pretty worked up because I woke a little before daylight. The camp looked much more foreboding under the darkness, the slender trees wrapping around the sky until all you could see were shrouds. Even creepier was the fact that I could see all the camp supervisors standing in a circle outside. I couldn't tell what was going on, but several of them were hunched over awkwardly. The sight was very unsettling, and I quickly hid away from my window so they wouldn't see me. It was at that point I realized that two of my roommates were not in the cabin. I'd seen them go to bed that night. But now their beds were fully made and their belongings were nowhere to be found. Out of panic, I woke up my remaining roommate to get some answers. When I told him our roommates were gone, he got agitated with me and said we had no roommates before going back to sleep. When day came, 
I left the cabin to investigate. Now there are only one or two kids near the cafeteria, but none of them seemed alarmed in any way. I kept repeating what my remaining roommate had said to me that night. Was he pulling some kind of sick joke on me? The camp supervisors were acting completely normal, but I didn't dare ask him anything. I started asking every kid I could find where the other campers were. And each time, they said there were only 16 of us. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. There were definitely more than 16 campers the first day. Elwood had said there were 64. Were well, they abducting some of us at night? If so, why was I... I, the only one who could remember anything. Something wasn't right here, and I had to figure out what it was. I was beyond relieved to find Brian out by the lake. At least there was one person here who would listen to me. When I got to him, I frantically started explaining everything that I'd seen. The more I told him, the more concerned his expression got. By the time I finished, he was actually sweating, and he had completely lost eye contact with me. I don't know what you're talking about, he said, blankly. There were only 16 of us that registered to stay. <sighs> Maybe you just got confused when all the families were here. Brian was staring at the ground so hard, you'd think there was a snake there. My heart sank as I realized that I couldn't trust him anymore. I had never felt so utterly and completely alone. Without saying another word, I got up and left. I was walking in a fog, not even aware of where I was headed. Fear and dread was beginning to take over me. I had to find some place to hide. Eventually I wandered back to my cabin, where I stayed under my covers for the remainder of the day. I didn't know what else to do, so I laid there helpless until I miraculously drifted to sleep. I wasn't surprised at all when I woke up to see my cabin completely empty. Sure enough, the few campers I managed to track down believed there were only eight of us. This was way too much for me to handle. My survival instincts were beginning to kick in. I made sure no one was looking and I darted off as fast as I could towards the exit of the camp. I was surrounded by at least 70 miles of wilderness, but it was better than just waiting to disappear. <sighs> but they must have been watching me, because I was intercepted within less than a minute by Elwood and three supervisors. Elwood had a huge grin on his face and was staring at me with eyes wide open. Whoa there, little buddy. <laughs> Where are you running off to? I'd sure have hell to pay from your parents if I lost one of my only eight campers. <laughs> An impulse told me to fight, but I knew I was outmatched and outnumbered. They started closing in on me causing me to back up slowly. Suddenly, Elwood stopped. I know what you need. He smiled ominously at me. You need to play charades with us. Come on, it's just about to start. Feeling trapped and violated, I reluctantly agreed and followed him to the bench area. I played charades all day feeling sick as I pushed down my desire to yell for help. I didn't sleep at all that night. I didn't look out of the window either. I didn't think I could handle seeing any more late night gatherings by my prison guards. When the morning of the fifth day came, I felt hung over from stress. My eyes had sunken in and my skin felt dry. There were now only four campers left, which didn't even make sense anymore. As I got my breakfast, 
I looked up at Mr. Todd and remembered how he had been the only one I felt was normal. Now that I was thinking about it, I didn't see him in the circle of supervisors outside either. He was my only chance. So I very quietly whispered to him, Mr. Todd, please help me. They're gonna take me if you don't do something. Mr. Todd didn't look at me, but I could see him trying hard to keep his composure. His eyes looked like they were slightly watering, and he was shaking. It reminded me of the way Brian reacted when I reached out to him. If you need to talk, come see me by the lake this afternoon. He responded, after what felt like an eternity. I could tell by the way he said it that he wanted to end the conversation for now, so I quickly headed out to eat. I waited by the lake for the entire day, but Mr. Todd never showed up. I waited until dark, when a supervisor came and escorted me back to my cabin. I felt defeated, and due to not having slept in two days, I felt exhausted. I fell asleep within minutes and enjoyed the temporary peace. It was the sixth day now. The week was almost over. I wondered to myself if I would survive it, which made me appreciate the speech Elwood gave the first day. <laughs> he hadn't been exaggerating when he said I would learn what it means to survive. I knew that if someone made it through this, it would be a miracle. To my disappointment, Mr. Todd was not in the cafeteria serving breakfast that day. The new cook was Mr. Beardsley, and he had never heard of Mr. Todd. It was now down to two campers, but what really shocked me was that the only other camper left besides me was Brian. I hadn't spoken to Brian since he'd lied to me. I felt uneasy about him, but I was beginning to accept that there may be nothing more I could do. Perhaps as a way to make peace with my situation, I sat down with Brian and began to talk. You may be hiding something from me, but you're the closest thing I have to a friend. I don't want to try to force the truth out of you. I just want one last day to enjoy. Can you give me that? Brian looked at me, his eyes lighten up a bit. I knew you'd come around. There's no need to be depressed during your whole vacation. The two of us talked about sci-fi shows and website design for the rest of the day. And I actually felt some comfort in taking my mind off my grim reality. I awake on the seventh day with a heavy heart. I knew Brian would be gone, and it would just be me and the supervisors. My parents were due to pick me up early tomorrow, so I didn't completely let go of the hope of getting home. I felt genuinely spooked walking around camp. The workers were all fixated on me, and staring at me obsessively. They kept calling me their favorite little camper and tried to put on show after show in front of me. The new cook still made all the meals in bulk and just left the food I didn't take sitting out to rot. I tried jogging as a distraction, but Elwood would just follow right behind me and compliment me on my form. I was thankful when the sun finally went down and I was left alone in my cabin. There was no way I was falling asleep tonight. I couldn't risk getting abducted like all the others. I started drinking from a mug of coffee that I'd gotten from the cafeteria. I expected to feel energized quickly, but it felt like it was making me more tired, if anything. I drank more to try to wake up, but it only made my eyelids feel heavier. Something was in the coffee. 
something was welcome to Camp Slanterwood Elwood shouted through his microphone we have a great turnout this week 64 teens have come to learn what it means to survive I didn't see anything in the brochure like that a freckle-faced kid whispered to another camper in the crowd. You don't think that has anything to do with that missing kid from last year, do you? Nah, this place is totally safe. The second camper answered back. By the way, I'm Brian. December 10th. 2003. My frozen hands tremble as I fumble to work my little butane lighter. The tips of my fingers are raw and bloodied already, and I wince in pain with every failed attempt to spark a flame. Finally, I achieve a jittery fire which impatiently dances atop the lighter. I carefully lower it to my pile of kindling and the fire cautiously creeps out and spreads until it's a healthy size. I watch it for a while, tending to it until it's strong. Now, there is enough light to see around me and enough heat to survive the night. Here, deep in the forest, with everything frozen and quiet, the only light and sound comes from my fire. It's the whole world to me right now. It dances and sings in a raspy, crackling voice to me, and I am happy to enjoy its company. I can almost imagine that I can hear it whispering and babbling happily. It's so cold. I must be tired. I'm hearing things. The popping and sizzling of the fire is really beginning to sound like words. Maybe I'm just lonely out here. Maybe I just really want someone to talk to. So I'm hearing coherence in the chaos of the fire. I could have sworn I heard it say, It's so cold. There it was again softer this time. I lean closer to the blaze and its warmth caresses my face, setting me at ease. I'm listening intently now, anxious for what I'll hear next. If you let me die tonight, you'll die tonight. There was no mistake in it. It said it clearly albeit in a raspy, sing-song voice of a fire consuming wet branches. Yet even as the words became clearer, they become softer, drawing me in closer to make out the next statement. The warmth splashes over me as I inch my face closer, and the frost that had settled in my bones begins to thaw. The fire is speaking constantly now, chattering quietly to itself and I can pick out only bits of words and portions of sentences. Get closer. Watch closely. If I die, you die. I'm the only thing keeping you alive. Pay attention. The fire ends its tirade with a loud snap of burning wood, and then is quiet. I lean in even closer, eager to receive whatever secret is coming next. The heat is no longer pleasant. It sears me as the flames playfully lick at my face. The fire is being coy teasing me with its silence to see how long I will wait on it. The smoke reaches into my nostrils and the embers float carelessly from the heart of the fire into my eyes, 
which are now welling with ash. I don't care. I just want to hear what comes next. Get closer. Pay attention. Watch closely now more than ever. December 17th. 2003. In other news, the charred body of an unidentified man was found deep in the mountainous forests east of the city. Investigators have stated that the man appeared to have caught fire while sitting by his campfire and, inexplicably, did not appear to have made any effort to extinguish himself. His burned remains were found, frozen in position by the icy temperatures leaning over the ashes of a long extinguished fire. In what is perhaps the most bizarre detail of the grisly scene, the man is reported to have been found with an expectant smile still on his face. 